This is episode 56 of a series where we examine the cut content, design, and development of Fallout New Vegas. The feral ghouls inside Repcon test site are numbered 1 through 16, but many of them are notably missing. This is one of the first dungeons players are likely to explore, so these enemies were probably cut to make it easier. Outside Repcon test site, there's a path that splits from the main road and leads right up to a gated off cave entrance. Perhaps this was once an additional entrance into Repcon or a cut dungeon, but in the final game, it's nothing more than a strange dead end. There's two more inaccessible caves like this, one south of Vault 19 and another near NCR Correctional Facility. These were probably meant to be dungeons, and they would have gone a long way in making the Mojave feel more alive. One of FNV's weakest aspects are the empty areas of desert that have nothing to do or interact with. The secondary dungeons that do appear aren't particularly interesting for the most part either. Josh Sawyer revealed what happened with the game's dungeons. I always thought dungeons were important. We didn't have time to make enough of them at a high enough level of detail. Our secondary location world builders, Denise McMurray and Sydney Wolfram, had half a day per interior and one day per exterior location. That means everything, going from a blob of barely sculpted, mono-textured landscape to something content complete. There's an unused creature called Legion Creature, and it's a part of the Feral Goal faction. It has a weird, unfinished visual effect on his hands, and perhaps its melee attack would have dealt additional radiation damage. NCR soldiers transformed into Feral Ghouls can be found at Camp Searchlight, but there's no Legion equivalent. Perhaps the Legion Creature would have appeared at Cottonwood Cove after the player released radioactive barrels there. There's an unused door marker placed way underground, almost at the bottom of the map, not far from Helios 1. It normally can't be selected and can only be manipulated after disabling one of the settings in the GEC. It strangely leads to an out of bounds door that's placed right outside the door leading out of Boone's house. If you clip outside the playable area, you can still travel through it and it warps you to the marker just outside Helios 1. I have never come across another marker like this before, and it's unknown what its exact purpose is. It might be an unused system for teleporting NPCs to a location quickly, or it might be a fix for an engine bug. This doesn't appear to ever be used in the final game though, and it's an interesting artifact of FNV's development you would normally never see. If you have Eddie's companion perk, Advanced Sensors, you'll notice an enemy on your map at Helios 1, but there are no enemies around and nothing attacks you. It turns out there's actually a floating invisible turret placed at the top of the tower, and it's used when firing the orbital laser during the quest That Lucky Old Sun. Oliver Swanick is one of FNV's most memorable characters, so it's only fitting he has cut content of his own. In the final game, he's either killed by the player or runs off into the desert and is killed by rad scorpions. However, he has unrecorded lines that seem to imply the player was once meant to have an additional encounter with him. The player could say, you're the guy who won the lottery. Oliver would reply, lottery. You remember the lottery? Attacking the player. God damn you. I don't need to remember that. There's also a second cut interaction where the player would say, do you remember the message you were told to spread? Bewildered. The message? You know about that? There was some kind of message, but I don't seem to remember. Jubilant again. Yeah, that air. Smell it. We've talked about how the followers of the Apocalypse were once a major faction, and how the player could once give them the Platinum Chip. The main quest was reworked before any of the followers' main quest was implemented, as it's only referenced in-game in an unfinished script. 
Another reference to their questline appears to have survived in the Collector's Edition guide. Sections of the guide seem to have been taken directly from the design documents, and this paragraph on the Legion is particularly interesting. It reads, Besides a highly unlikely military defeat, Caesar fears one thing only, exposure. The denizens of the Waste are too ignorant to realize that his entire empire is a grand act of plagiarism, but the followers of the Apocalypse know exactly who he is and what he has done. Should his tribe discover that he cribbed the entire culture from books about ancient Rome, rather than having its customs dictated to him by Mars, well, it's very unlikely that could happen. And he won't let it happen. That's why his forces have a standing order to kill all followers of the Apocalypse on sight, and to brutalize all civilized or learned captives, and haul them before Caesar's interrogators. Those who make the mistake of saying, Hey, you guys, it's like you're emulating the ancient Roman Empire, end up as severed heads on poles. The idea of Caesar being exposed as a fraud and brought down by the followers in a non-violent method is really interesting. Of course, there's nothing like this in-game though, and the faction ended up being inconsequential to the final main questline. The official guide is a treasure trove of cut content, and in the Good Springs chapter it mentions, The townsfolk have a few interesting items on their corpses. Trudy has a prospector saloon expense list. The rest have guns and ammunition. Take what you want and leave this place. Trudy never has an item called prospector saloon expense list in her inventory, and there's not even an item named that in the game files anymore. This note was apparently cut and deleted at some point between the guide being written and the game being released. There's another remnant of early development that reads, Run by the Sawnees, the Ultralux pampers its clients and provides the Strip's most elite casino experience. The Sawnees was the early name for what would eventually become the White Glove Society, and this appears to be the only reference to the name that still exists. The name Sani is an homage to the legend of Alexander Sani Bean, a folk tale about a clan of Scottish cannibals. This story was written in England in a time where there was widespread Scottish prejudice, and the entire story was essentially anti-Scottish propaganda. This is seemingly why their name was later changed. Perhaps the most obvious exception in the ending slides are the lack of endings for the Chairman, the White Glove Society, and the Omertas. Josh Sawyer revealed why they don't have ending slides in a Formspring post. I think we decided against having Strip Family endings because the volume of endings was already quite high. If I were able to add one more group to the ending slides, it would be the three Strip Families. There's some cut player sounds called Player Inner Syro slash Player Leave Syro, and there are versions for both male and female players. These seem to be sounds for the player holding their breath while looking down the sights of a weapon, something that likely only would have been available when using scoped weapons. Holding your breath to increase accuracy is a mainstay of first person shooters, so it's too bad it was cut. <sighs> <sighs> Remnants from a press demo are still present in the game files, and this is most likely the demo that was shown at E3 2010. All of the code is still present, and it shows us exactly how the demo played out. At one point, the player was warped to Prem where they fought three raiders. These NPCs were never deleted and are called Press Demo Raider. The player was then warped to the tops, and the tops cashier has a line that would transport the player to Camp Forlorn Hope. This line was disabled after the press demo and can normally never be heard. The player could say, enough gambling, more fighting take me to the no man's land near Camp Forlorn Hope. And she'd reply, 
You'll need someone to watch your back. Craig Boone and NCR Sniper will be joining you. Keep your head down out there. At Camp Forlorn Hope, the player fought the Legion at Nelson. During an interview at E3 2010, Chris Avalone mentioned something very interesting about this section of the demo, stating, Throughout the game, there'll be points where you can command small squads of troops, but usually you're just commanding a single companion. This suggests Obsidian considered the ability to control non-companion NPCs through the companion wheel. The April 2010 edition of Official Xbox Magazine had an early preview of FNV, and it seems to reference the player commanding the characters in Good Springs during the quest Good Springs Gunfight. But banishing buddies to your base shouldn't even occur in New Vegas thanks to the companion wheel. From this easy to navigate menu, you can talk to your pals and direct them to be aggressive or passive, heal themselves and more. Obsidian ordered our Good Springs amigos to go on the offensive while our hero whipped out the 9-iron he was given earlier. There doesn't seem to be any remaining reference to this in-game, which is too bad because controlling small groups of NPCs would have been an awesome addition. The press demo even created some cut content. There were two Cazadors outside Camp Forlorn Hope that were disabled to make the press demo easier, but they were never enabled afterwards. Quartermaster Maze at Camp Forlorn Hope also has a press demo line. The player could say, I'll look for your men and supplies. Send me to Helios. Thanks. Watch your back out there. Never know when those Legion bastards might show up. The player was then transported to Helios 1, and the code for this section strangely gave the player reputation with both the NCR and the Brotherhood of Steel. This is potentially notable because no Brotherhood of Steel NPCs appear around Helios 1 in the final game. Why bother giving the player reputation with the faction unless they were present? To end this episode, we're going to talk about the tragic tale of night vision goggles. They were first planned to appear in the series all the way back in 2001 for Micro Forte's Fault Tactics. Like you would expect, they would have improved accuracy at night, but they were eventually cut, likely due to the game's short development cycle. Concept art and an inventory icon still remain in the game files though. They were then slated to appear in Black Isle's Cancelled Fall 3. They're referenced in one of its design documents and would have been worn by a group of NCR soldiers. One of the design documents for the sequel to Interplay's Fall Brotherhood of Steel reads, This is the state of the art in night vision. Put these on and the screen goes green and all of your enemies pop out like fireflies. Don't ever let them sneak up on you when the sun goes down. This reveals they were also considered for Brotherhood of Steel 2, but it was mercifully cancelled. Bethesda thought they were a good idea for Fallout 3, but they were also cut from the final version. They were meant to be the hat that went along with one of the game's mercenary outfits, Wasteland Clothing 04. There are alternate versions for both male and female characters, as well as an unused Pip-Boy icon. It seems to have been cut early though, as there's no other remnant of the item. Bethesda experimented with the idea once again in Fallout 3's DLC, Operation Anchorage, this time as a unique variant of biker goggles called the Peepers. These are identical to the biker goggles found in-game, except they have code for a night vision effect. They still appear in one of Fallout 3's test cells, a very interesting interior called Test Fill. The peepers were also cut, seemingly due to an issue with implementing night vision, as the effect is still in a very unfinished, unusable state. Obsidian apparently found these files and thought night vision goggles were worth pursuing too, as there are unused EGM files related to it that weren't present in Fallout 3. EGM files are used to align headgear to the heads of NPCs, which vary in size and shape. 
This suggests they were also considered for New Vegas, but it's possible this is more Fallout 3 content, as there are instances of unused Fallout 3 content appearing in FNV's game files. That gives Night Vision goggles the distinction of being cut from at least four, potentially five Fallout games, making it the most cut idea in the series' history as far as I know. The ability to see in the dark lives on in New Vegas though, with the Varmint Rifle's night vision scope, the Chem Cat Eye, Ghost Sight from Dead Money, and the Hazmat Dark Light Cowl from Old World Blues. These changes would have made FNV into an even better game. Ultimately though, all of this was left on the cutting room floor.